Welcome to the Spirited Conversation podcast, Straight Talk, Served Neat. Join us to hear from business leaders, entrepreneurs, and industry insiders as they discuss their stories and insights for success. Now, share a spirit and make a toast as you immerse yourself in the conversation. Here's your host and Chief Libation Officer, Tony DeBlau. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tony DeBlau. This is the next podcast installment of Spirit of Conversation. And today, I'm joined by Tom Licks, who is the founder and CEO of Cleveland Whiskey, that I featured as part of my other Spirit of Conversation with the Legion M founders. And so I was really excited to follow up with Tom and learn more about his journey and his product. Tom, welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks. Right. So, 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 Tom, this is a very, you know, very, very interesting story. I mean, from from a lot of different angles. Uh, so, a lot of people, just so that they understand a little bit about your background, you've had a lot of exposure, even you know, as a kid. You know, you've you've always pursued uh, tinkering, experimenting, being curious. Uh, it's it's led you to many different parts of the world, uh, including going into the Navy, and talk about that, because I think that leading us into the story towards the creation of Cleveland Whiskey, I think, had a pretty big origin story in the Navy. So talk a little bit about that. Well, it, it did, and, and I, I think the origin story is actually earlier, but let me talk about the Navy first. So um, uh, this was, gee, over 40 years ago, and I'm certainly giving away my age when I do that, but 40 years ago I was in the Navy, I was a college dropout at the time, and I got trained as a machinist mate, and uh, for a variety of reasons, one of the schools I got sent to was distilling school. Now, you know, you may wonder about distilling school, but it was actually for the making of fresh water, so much of the same principles and practices are involved in separating, you know, uh, alcohol from, uh, uh, you know, what you start with as a beer is the same thing as doing fresh water, separating the fresh water from the salt water and leaving the brine behind. So I went to this school, and then I got stationed on this old destroyer. It was about to be decommissioned. It was a reserve ship. The bottom line is most of the officers really weren't there, and it was run by a bunch of older chief petty officers. The very first day I got on this ship, this one chief comes up to me and he says, kid, and it was a long time ago, but he says, kid, you're going to be my apprentice on this ship. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but when he led me down into the spaces and he took me below, he opens up this one hatch, and inside he is fermenting fruit juice from the galley. It was just sort of a sugar Kool-Aid. He had a whole rack of different sized, uh, you know, vessels, stainless steel, half barrels and things like that. And it I mean, it smelled delicious, but he was making uh, raw alcohol, uh, just fermenting this sugared Kool-Aid. And he had also then tapped into the steam lines that went throughout the ship. And of course, these old ships are all powered by steam and the steam turbines and the equipment and everything else. And then he'd also tapped into uh, the seawater lines that went throughout the ship that cooled the spaces and cooled the equipment. So he had all the things that he really needed and lots of spare parts. And he had put together this jury-rigged still he was making what he called hooch for the ship. It was just a clear, mm -hmm. sort of grainy alcohol. And uh, not only was he selling it on our ship, but he was selling it to all the surrounding ships as well. He had quite the business going, and I was his apprentice there on that ship. And that was just one of the things that got me into this. And, and, and from that, you know, sort of, I'll say, underground approach, to uh, you know, a different type of you know, distilling you know process. What started to stir in you as far as, hey, there's something, there's something more here. I mean, after you were you know done you know with the Navy, did, was that something that yeah. sort of always carried with you, or did you put it on the shelf for a well, while? I yeah, I really put it up to the side, and, and you know, I, I went through a couple of things. I've started a couple of businesses. My last one was uh, a software and application services company. Um, but, you know, it was something I sort of thought I, I might be interested in going back to, and then I think what, what triggered again is when I read an article maybe 15 years ago about people in, um, it, it was actually an article about people entering the middle class in China for the first time. And it talked about how people, when they enter the middle class, they're looking for affordable luxuries. 
you know, things they couldn't get before. And, and as I read that, I was thinking this is, you know, it's really not affordable luxuries, it's conspicuous affordable luxuries, things that you can share with your friends. So I started researching this a little bit more, and I become more and more, you know, throughout my career, more and more interested in market opportunities where disruption through technology could take place. Uh, you know, I mentioned before I was a college dropout when the Navy, when I went in the Navy, I later got a doctorate at Boston University, and I've, you know, gone off and done a, a lot of different things, but I've always been fascinated by industries that hadn't changed in a long period of time. So, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, and researching a little bit more, and I realize that, okay, these emerging middle class populations, which are growing by leaps and bounds around the world, in China, and in India, and in Africa, South America, and this was even before we started moving back into brown spirits here in this country, I said, if demand starts occurring around products like imported bourbon, which is a perfect, you know, conspicuous, affordable consumption item, you're not going to be able to crank up production like cornflakes or computer parts. You have to put this stuff away and plan for demand, you know, 8, 10, 12 years in advance. So I said, there's a market opportunity if only somebody can solve this idea that, you know, it, it should be able to take a longer period of time. And, of course, whiskey is an industry that, for better or for worse, and a lot of people say, gee, it's wonderful that it hasn't changed in hundreds of years, but it hasn't changed in such a long time in generations. I thought there had to be an opportunity there, so I started experimenting. And, you know, I tell people I would probably be a chemist if I had a better attention span. I just don't have that attention span, but I love chemistry. I've always, uh, you know, I've, I've always played with it. I've always been an amateur at it. So I started experimenting. I'm going through the patent files, thinking about what worked and what didn't. I probably blew up over 600 mason jars in my basement. My wife was convinced that the police were going to knock on the door, thinking we had a meth lab down there because I was, you know, I was emptying these big containers uh, full of ice outside the gas stations like every weekend. And I was loading in hundreds of pounds of ice. I was exploding all these mason jars playing with things, and because I'm not a real chemist, I made some, really, in, in retrospect, some stupid mistakes, but those stupid mistakes pointed me in directions that nobody ever would have really thought of, and and I was lucky enough to sort of come across some, some at least, uh, features of the technology that we now have today, and that started me down this path. And and that's and and I think that that experimentation, you know, drive driven with obviously your you know your curiosity, uh, leads me to the question of so, the background with you know these businesses that you started and then and the consulting you know work that, that that you've done, how did you assess risk? I mean, you you talked about market identification, <laughs> so you're sort yeah. of dance around category definition, but how did yeah. you? as an entrepreneur, say that this is a good risk to go down? Well, you know, whiskey itself is a $25 billion business, and the whole idea that you might have a market that uh, grows so quickly in a space where traditional manufacturers, and there's a limited number of traditional manufacturers, they just won't know what to do. It just seems so exciting to me. Now, you know, I can do the spreadsheets as well as anybody else, but to me it was more, I think it was it, what started me was more of an emotional decision. I said, oh my God, this is an incredible opportunity. I need to work in this space. And and I've always been a little bit like that. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned sort of the origin of this. Um, I remember, uh, you know, back when I was eight years old and I got my first chemistry set, and it, you know, I got it for Christmas, and I remember the first, uh, not only did I get a chemistry set, but I got a little uh, model rocket ship at the same time. And of course, chemistry sets, you know, years ago were different than what you have today. I mean, I remember our chemistry sets all came with a bottle of mercury in them, for instance. All the kids who got chemistry sets that Christmas, we came back to school with dark spots on our fingers because we'd been pushing mercury around the table and playing with it. But I remember my, my parents were not home uh, one afternoon, and, and I had this, this rocket ship, and I had this chemistry set. So, of course, it, it, to me, it was only natural. I wanted to make a rocket fuel for my little model rocket ship. And I took everything down to the basement. I borrowed a bunch of pots and pans. I'm mixing up everything for my chemistry set. Trying to, I, had a, I remember I had a, a box of wooden matches, and I kept striking matches and seeing if I could light it, and nothing was happening. I started pulling 
things from out of the closet and then underneath the basement sink. And, and at one point, all of a sudden, it starts bubbling. And it's bubbling vigorously and putting off this smoke. And I'm so excited. I'm saying, oh, wow, I finally have made this rocket fuel. And again, I'm only eight, so I'm a little naive. But I slap the lid on this pot. And it turns out it was um, the, a cracked lid in an old pressure cooker that my mom was throwing away. I didn't realize yeah. it at the time, but when I slapped the lid on it, uh, it was already defective. Now, I ran across the other side of the basement to get more of whatever I just pulled out and added to the mix. And all I remember at that point is waking up in a hospital room because the, wow. uh, the, the, the pot, uh, I guess the lid cracked and exploded. It sent some shrapnel around the basement. It hit the hot water heater. Started a small explosion, but also a fire. Almost burned down the family home. Needless to say, I lost my chemistry set privileges for a couple of years. But, <laughs> but it's always just been my nature to experiment and try things and say, well, gee, if if I if I don't have something, I'm going to make it. Or if there's an opportunity, I want to go for it. And I think the the whiskey space was just one of those things that said, wow, this could be really interesting. And uh, yeah, a lot of perseverance, a lot of experimentation, but also some luck that that got me to where we are today, at least. Right, and obviously a, a like of bourbon has to go. Yeah, yeah, def definitely, and and you know a like of something, but also sort of a um, you know technology is big to me, and I, I I don't think I think there's I have a lot of respect for tradition and how things are done, but at the same time I think there's always ways to improve them. And of course, um, you know, I just saw an opportunity to do this, and it wasn't just about making it wasn't about making something faster. It was about meeting some demands that I thought traditional practices weren't going to be able to do. And as you know, we've you know we've actually pivoted a little bit, and and we're now making bourbons finished with other woods that only because of the technology. It's something that enables us to do that, and it, and it's because we can experiment so quickly uh, that we can try lots of new things. Right, and and that and that leads me to sort of how you, you know, so now you have this idea, you you, you see this identification of a market, you have this, obviously the passion, um, the ingenuity. So now you have got to get this thing off the ground, and you had prior experience with you know investing, and you know you had some initial investments given to kick things off, uh, you know, back in I guess two thousand nine with a. Yeah. Yeah. 2013 launch. What right. what brought you to doing the WeFunder thing? I mean, were, were uh, you intrigued by the Jobs Act, or was there something else driving that? Uh, so so uh, yeah, we had brought on some angel funding. I had some you know fairly sizable funding to get us started. Uh, you know, because people were investing in a technology company. You know, it wasn't uh, an investment in a craft distiller or a micro distiller. I don't claim to be that. We're really an innovation company. Uh, working in this distilled spirit space. Um, but what intrigued me about the Title III crowdfunding was that um, we could bring on uh, essentially the consumers, the people who buy our whiskey, as our owners as well. And I just thought that was, that was fantastic, the idea that you own a little piece of a company where you're also buying the product. And I, and I felt like that would create this you know, already we have really good fans and customers, but that would just ratchet everything all up. So that I wanted to wind up with 500 ambassadors out there looking after us and promoting us and talking about it. And there's nothing like you know, it's one thing when you talk about, gee, I just bought this new product and it's pretty good and everything else. But if you are buying a product and then you own part of the company, you're going to talk about it that much more. And we've already seen. I mean, our, our round hasn't even closed yet, but I'm already talking to a French distributor that one of our investors in Paris linked me up with. We're in a, a small chain of retail stores in upstate New York that we never would have gotten into except for one of our investors who lives up near Syracuse uh, got us in and, and you know really helped us get in the door and, and, and testify uh, as to how good we were. Um, we're doing things in, uh, you know, we'll likely get some distribution in California because of that. We're moving into Florida. That'll, that'll be the next state. And all of it is because now we have a group of people that are interested in, in our success. And it's just wonderful. I mean, I have 
I took a phone call uh, right before this one uh, from one of our small new small investors. He's from Alaska, and he was traveling through, and he called me and he says, any chance I can come by the distillery? And I set something up for him. But it's like now we're getting in people from all around the world. Last week I had somebody from Singapore who had invested in us. And he came in, he brought in a couple of his friends, they in turn invested in us, but they're, you know, it's, it's less about the money because it's, it's, you know, it's not raising huge amounts of money, but it really is about getting all these excited evangelists out there. And I think that's a really big deal. Yeah, and, and I, you know, probably should have made a disclaimer up front, you know, I am an investor. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, of course, coming from the land of Silicon Valley, you know, like these kinds of things. And uh, it, it leads me to think about, I mean, this this is great success. And, you know, you're talking about people's, you know, curiosity turning into, you know, to evangelism. But it's not without its challenges. I think, you know, Richard Branson said, uh, disruption is all about risk-taking, trusting your intuition, and rejecting the way things are supposed to be. Right, and you and that spades with the traditional market's response to what yeah. you're trying to do. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, well, certainly. I mean, we have been called heretics, and certainly there have been people who said that what we're doing is sacrilege and that it's wrong to somehow violate the traditions associated with uh, you know, production of spirits, but you know, it's the same conversations and the same types of things that you know the automobile companies went through, microwave ovens, airplanes. I mean, there's always it's always a big deal when you're making changes, and some people you will never convert. Uh, you know, it was interesting. We had um, uh, President Obama came in and took a tour of uh, the distillery. And uh, this was last year. He was only supposed to be here for like four to six minutes. He wound up spending half an hour with us. I think he really enjoyed himself. And um, but you know he had never been to a distillery before, and and it upset some people. Um, you know, the, I'm, I'm sure the folks in Kentucky weren't all that happy with us. Uh, and we did have one writer who wrote and thought that he, you know, he thought it was interesting. The president who could have gone to any number of wonderful, large, traditional, you know, companies with rich traditions in Tennessee and Kentucky, and yet he chose um, uh, Little Cleveland Whiskey, the number one hated bourbon distillery among <laughs> whiskey drinkers. And yeah. I just, you know, it's like, and it's true, and, and um, you know, I wanted to call him up and say, you know, hey, thanks for calling us number one. Nobody had ever called us that before. But, um, uh, you know, it, that's just, that's just who we are. And we've embraced that and said, look, we're not trying to be the same. We're not hiding the fact that we're doing it uh, in a different way. Uh, we're just trying to make a good product. And, and the stuff we make today is better than what we made last year, and that's better than what we made the year before. And we're just keep trying to experiment and improve it and, and do things differently. Uh, and not everybody will like that, but that is who we are. And, and uh, you know, we say some of our taglines are radically different, no excuses, and the no excuses part is a big deal. We will keep trying very, very hard to make, you know, good, exceptional, and increasingly different spirits. Um, just that's who we are. Right. And, and, and along those lines, because you're absolutely right, I mean, you're smack dab in the middle of a lot of different things converging, right? Not only is there the bourbon sh uh, shortage, um, but there's this whole argument about you know where it's produced and you know, sure. that that, that the, the narrative of of whiskey is always such a big thing like who made it who's and who's master seller. Right. Right. You're, you're 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 bucking all of those different trends. So where do you it, weigh it, in but, on some of that stuff with the craft? Well, well, let, yeah. Well, let me also say that there there is a narrative, but it's a narrative among. Um, a relatively small proportion of the people who actually drink the spirits. So yes, there's a lot of discussion about these things, but it's among a relatively small group. But it, but it's a group that that you know they get attention, and that's fine. And and we've just said, look, we will, um, you know, we'll we'll roll with those punches, and we will keep doing what we think we can do best, and just try to keep making better and better spirits. That's that's our job, and that's what we do. Um, you know there is discussion, and you can certainly read about it. But the, you know, the the new drinkers, people sort of coming up through the system, trying whiskeys for the first time, trying bourbons and scotch and everything else for the first time, they're open to new tastes and new flavors. And there's also, you know, a, 
a, a sizable, I, well, maybe sizable is the wrong word, but it, but it, it, it's a, there is a reasonably sized uh, group of people who say, ah, you're using technology to make this. We're interested. We're interested because it is innovative. We're interested not because you've made it the same way you've made it you know, through five generations, but we're interested because, you know what, this is actually something new and different. So we just right. approach it from a different angle. And, and, and that's the other thing I, I, I'm very, you know, fascinated about is as much as you've come to this point where you've developed, you know, technology to, you know, get this process down of, you know, accelerated aging and, and so on, you're at the same time innovating by dint of using these different woods and, you know, taking it completely out of the normal process. So. How, how talk about that side of the innovation on just the woods and the choice of woods? Well, you know, I, I think the interesting because we have a technology that that uh, does accelerate things. It allows us to do a lot of experimentation. I mean, imagine if you're a traditional distiller and you want to try something different, and you know, make it, and you put it in a barrel, and you might test it after two years, four years, six years, and maybe eight years. You say, you know, this is pretty good. Let's make some more of it. Uh, and I'm, I, I mean, I will readily admit I'm just not that patient a person. Uh, but with us, we can keep trying new things. And, and one of the things that we sort of thought of as we entered the space and started producing traditional bourbons was that everything was done in oak barrels. So for well over a thousand years, we've been getting our flavor in spirits. Uh, by letting them sit in oak barrels, and it was really sort of an accidental discovery. I mean, barrels weren't made to provide flavor for spirits. They were made to hold, you know, hold liquid and hold other things, and, you know, they, they had a bulge in the middle so you could roll them down a dirt road and roll them up onto ramps on ships, and, you know, somebody left something in a barrel for a longer period of time than usual, and people started noticing that, yes, in fact, it tastes better if you leave it in a barrel. But we chose to use oak. It was the European oaks, and now we use here in this country the American white oak, because they hold liquid pretty well, not because somebody was pressing it enough to say, wow, that's going to give it a wonderful flavor. What if you made a barrel out of black cherry, for instance? And I'm sure somebody in the past tried that, and they likely would have found that most of these woods, either they weren't straight grained enough or the uh, the pore structure uh, just wasn't right to hold liquid. So most of them would simply leak like a sieve. So we've stuck with oak barrels, and all whiskeys essentially have almost like they have the same DNA. You know, it's like that's where they come from. And if 60, sometimes some people say even 80% of the flavor, but certainly 60% of the flavor is coming from the interaction with the wood, wouldn't it behoove us to not just experiment with things like grain or whether we leave it in a barrel for eight years or 10 years, but let's try different woods. And there are thousands of different woods to try out there. And, and, and we've just barely scratched the surface. And you know, we found that a wood like black cherry and apple and even honey locust, you know, those are all interesting. Hickory makes a bourbon that almost it tastes like scotch. I mean, it's, it's amazing the different range of flavors you can get by using woods without adding flavor, without adding sugar or syrup or artificial you know, color, it's all unique and different because of the woods. And that that's just, to me at least, that's incredibly exciting. And I think it, it, it creates, again, its own space. I mean, there's just as much, you know, uh, the people who make barrels and char them and do all of that process is, is, is as much its own story as sure. you know, the actual, you know, distilling side. So let's look at where you are. So March 2013, was launch, and now here we are, are three layers, three years later. Um, you know what? What what are the major things that have evolved? I think you're you know, you're more international now. I mean, obviously the we funders helped create more, you know, awareness. But for you, in terms of where you started to where it is now and how it's going, um, anything that has been particular, uh, surprising, new, different, or you know. Um, like, hey, I learned something different about this because I didn't anticipate going in. Yeah. This was not what I thought. Or this, any any of those kinds of thoughts in terms of where you projected to be at this point? 
Um, you know, I think every day is almost a surprise. We, we discover new things every day. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we've taken, taken sort of a measured approach to our distribution. I think that, you know, domestically at least, and we're in 13 states going on 14. Uh, maybe we'll be in 15 or 16 by the end of the year, but we're trying to do that in a, in a measured way. I think there's so much opportunity overseas. Uh, we're in, um, you know, Germany, France, Belgium, Switzerland. Earlier this year, we started shipping in Japan. I'm hoping we'll be in, in China by the end of the year. Uh, and, and that's also where the traditional uh, uh, bourbon distillers are having trouble meeting demand. And, um, uh, you know, it gives us an opportunity to get on the shelves. It gives us an opportunity to build some brand names and build some recognition. And I'm all also finding that um, you know there's people who are intrigued around the world with uh, not everybody but but certainly uh, enough people are intrigued with the idea that we're doing something different uh, to give it a try and that's all I want is I want people to at least try it and generally you know people who try it are, are pleased and, and, and as you, as you continue with you know building that market and obviously the results of you know, the, the WeFunder campaign and so on. Do you see, or are you starting to see, because I'm getting that sense because you're such an entrepreneurial-oriented person, do you see the uh, homemade craft, you know, special edition bourbons, like a lot of these places do, like you can, you know, pay a fee and they hold a certain side of a barrel aside, but here, sure. arguably, you can say, well, I can create a very, very unique label to myself, you know, Joe and John's, you know, uh, you know, bourbon because I chose the wood and I can figure out if it's a win or a bust in, you know, less than a week. Right. I mean, is that something you're thinking about as well, a potential well, growth I'm place? glad you asked that question because uh, one of the things, you know, it's great. We have sort of a disruptive production process, but I'm also thinking about how do we disrupt the sales process as well, because it's a slow, heavily regulated, um, dominated by, you know, a few big players, and, you know, we need ways to sort of break out in the marketplace as well. And uh, one of the things we've started doing, uh, we started this last year, was creating something uh, we call the Uncommon Barrel, which really is a custom barrel program. So instead of selecting a barrel out of a warehouse, but you're essentially selecting, you know, the same spirit. It just is sitting in a different part of the warehouse, or it might be a little older or younger or whatever, and saying that's something you selected. We actually go into a, a retailer or a restaurant or, a, you know, a, um, you know a, a number of bars to, who have gotten together, and we'll create a custom blend just for them. And it might be a mix of different oak intensities as well as a little bit of the tartness of an apple wood finish that might be mixed with a little bit of the smokiness we get from a, uh, a hickory wood finish. So we make a, a very unique uh, finished bourbon for them. It's not flavored. It's finished with these other woods. Uh, we'll make it at whatever proof they want. And of course, it'll say custom blended for them on the bottle. And the beauty of that is that when I send a salesperson into um, a store, instead of selling you know, the first couple of bottles and having them sit on a shelf, um, I might sell 100 or 200 bottles uh, with that same type of sales call. And also, when somebody walks into the store, if they're not certain about what to get, if they ask somebody at the desk and say, or, or at the register and say, well, what would you recommend? Well, it's a high likelihood they'll say, well, you might want to try our own custom blend, and um, that's working out pretty well for us. Well, that's, that's fantastic, and I, I think that it's just a natural progression of all of the different elements and opportunities within this market. So, Tom, my last question for you, yeah. and I ask this always at all of my Spirit of Conversation uh, conversations, and that is, if you could have a drink with anybody, who would it be and why? I would pick uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And why is that? You know, he, I mean, he's a quintessential Renaissance man. I imagine he also had some sort of attention deficit disorder. He went from thing to thing. He was incredibly talented. He was so creative. He was brilliant. And I just think having a conversation with him, with him would be like tracking, uh, you know, five ping pong games at once because I imagine we would talk about him, you know, a, a thousand things in a short period of time. I just, I've always been fascinated with him, the work he did, 
the inventions that he came up with, you know, many of which are, you know, were just drawings yet, but way ahead of his time. And, uh, you know, I just think he's a remarkable figure in history. Great. Well, Tom, thanks again. I know we're doing potentially here a, a virtual toast together. I would be toasting with the uh, the hickory, having tried the black cherry from all of the wonderful assortment that uh, that you sent oh, me. The hickory was have you, have you absolutely. Tried the hickory? Have, have you tried the hickory yes. yet? Yes. No, have I you? tried a, a sample okay. of all of them yesterday. All right. Uh, for my and they're all different. It's amazing the different types of flavors you can get from these different woods. And of course, we're experimenting with woods like pistachio and mesquite and all sorts of other things as well. You'll see more of them coming out. Well, I'm like I said, I'm excited to to, to spread the word. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, to do that, I you know obviously appreciate your time. And uh, you know, again, thank you so much for being with me on Spirit Conversation. Well, Tony, cheers, and uh, it's been my pleasure and privilege. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For show notes and to get more insights from entrepreneurs and spirit lovers alike, please visit spiritedconversation.biz.